So most of you know my name is Mark Mudge and that I used to serve as a pastor here from 2014 to 2016 for a few years and I have known many of you for years and years and years. So I'm happy to be back home. Happy, it's kind of weird, I have two homes. I'm serving as a missionary in Guatemala and so as the, the church has developed there, more and more there, it's like I have a home here and I have a home there. So um, this, this morning during the Sunday school hour, I'm going to give a report about the work in Guatemala. And it's going to consist in three parts. We're going to look at a text about the work of the ministry for a few minutes. Then in the second part, I'll give a report about what's happened in the past year. And then the last part, I'll give it open to questions and answers. So let's, let's see how it goes with the... Let's go ahead and open up to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. So, again, this intro, I've been serving as a pastor of a small church in Guatemala City. Guatemala, it, for those, some, those of you who may not be familiar, Guatemala is a country in Central America, just below Mexico. It's about the size of Tennessee. There's about 14 million people in it. And we're in the capital city, where there's approximately 4 million people. It's about double the, the population of Orlando. It's much more condensed than Orlando. Orlando's very spread out. So uh, we just came in from uh, this past week from Guatemala City, and we plan to go back this next Thursday. So let's go ahead and look at the Ephesians 4, verses 7 to 16. We'll read it together to consider some points about the ministry. So Ephesians 4, verses 7 to 16 says, But to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this, he ascended. What does it mean? But that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children, tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined in it together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. What's particularly encouraging about this passage is how Christ-centered it is. If you look at how it begins in verse 7, it talks about, but to each one of us, so to every single person, grace was given. According to the measure of Christ's gifts, so Christ is the one who's giving it, you see that in verse 8, the quotation from the Old Testament, from Psalm 68, saying that he ascended on high. He's the one who's doing the action. Then verses 9 to 10 explains that action, with again him being the focus. And then he's the subject in, in verse 11. He himself gave some apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. So he's the one who's, who gave some. And then we, hear the, we see the purpose behind those giving of spiritual gifts explained in verses 11 to 16. Even in the, verse, in the explanation of why he's given spiritual gifts and particularly leaders to the church, in verse 12 we see it's for the edifying of the body of Christ and for the fullness of Christ. And then in verse 15 unto all things, who is the head, unto Christ. And then in verse 16, 
from whom refers back to Christ once again. So the entire text we see is, is has focused on Christ, why he's given spiritual gifts. And so we begin in verses 7 to 10, and we see that it is Christ is the king of spiritual gifts. He's the one, and so we, we want to look at this text in ministry. We want to see it from a God-centered perspective. We want to think about what does, is he doing? What is he accomplishing? Why is he giving spiritual gifts? Why is he talking about the ministry? Why, why is he referring about the ministry the way he, did, he does? And so it begins in verses 7 to 10 to describe the incarnation. Describe how Christ, in his humiliation and then his exaltation, his work of the, the work of the gospel, his coming, the Father sending him to this earth, his humiliation to take on humanity, and then his exaltation to be a, after his death and re, his, his resurrection, his ascension. And so when it describes this prophecy in, uh, in verse 8, and then, and then exposits it or explains it in verses 9 and 10, his exaltation and how he was exalted to the right hand of the Father, that work accomplished, it was the work that accomplished this giving of the spiritual gifts. So it describes it basically like a king, a conquering king, who has won the spoils in a battle, in victory, and then returns back home and gives the spoils, uh, the booty or the, um, the possessions that he's won in the victory in the war. So the great king here is Jesus Christ. His great victory is him becoming a man, dying on the cross, his substitutionary atonement, not only his humiliation or his humility in doing the work of forgiving, of dying in the place of sinners, taking the wrath of God in the place of sinners, but also his exaltation, his resurrection and, and ascension to the Father. And so in doing that, he comes back to heaven, and he comes back to heaven as a victorious king, as a victorious king who has gifts. He's won possessions in the battle. And now these gifts that he brings back are souls that he saved, peoples that he saved, and he gives them to gifts to his church. And we remember that it includes everyone, everyone who's a Christian, every member, of the a true member of the church of God, is one of those gifts. But here now in verse 11, he summarizes it in, the, in a way to explain some of the leadership, some of the clear examples of gifting that he gives to his church. And so again, Jesus is the focus because he's the one who's won the victory. He's the king of spiritual gifts in verses 7 to 10. And then we see in verses 11 to 16 this purpose behind it. And so he explains a list that's, that's greatly abused, and especially in, in Guatemala, they talk a lot about the fivefold ministry, about apostles and prophets and evangelists, pastors, teachers, and some, uh, many churches believe that if you don't have a, someone of each office, then you're not a true church. And so we understand here that this representation is a representation of leadership that Christ has given. Some have passed away. Some do not, were for the first century, Apostles, prophets, and some continue. Evangelists, pastors, teachers. And so, we remember here that the focus is on Christ's purpose. Christ's purpose in the ministry. It's for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. Why has he given gifted people to the church? Why do you have spiritual gifts? So that you would be a disciple who makes other disciples. Why are there leaders so that in the church? So that they would help, uh, they would be disciples who make other disciples. What's the purpose behind Christ's uh, work, great work here as a conquering king, bringing back gifts from his work of the gospel, humiliation, exaltation? He has a, a purpose in the ministry. He has a purpose in his church. He has a purpose of having a church, churches, full of disciples who make disciples. And so part of the purpose today, we're here to worship. Yes, 
We're here to glorify God. Yes. We're here to sing to God. Yes. We're here to listen to sermons. Yes. But we also remember that part of that, all of those things are included in and connected to the ministry that we would be disciples who make other disciples. And so we, we observe some of the purposes, fruits here, very briefly, in 11 to 16. It's so that all the saints, equipping for, it's for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, not just the leadership, but for everyone. And for what purpose? For the edifying of the body of Christ in verse 12. And then we observe other good fruits. Unity in verse 13. So that we would know Jesus Christ in verse 13. Christ, the conquering king, has won the victory in the gospel. And then he gives gifts to his church. Why does he give gifts to his church? One of the reasons. So that we would know him. So that we would know him and help others to know him. In verse 13, another fruit, another result, another purpose is so that we would become like him. Not only know him, but where it says to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we would be conformed to be like him. Then in 14, so that we would have some discernment. We wouldn't be children. What are ch children? They don't have discernment. Like if you take um, some of the kids out of the five-year-old's class and you take them and you say, oh, the nice man in the van has lollipops for kids, right? They don't, they need to have, uh, they don't have discernment. They don't know that that's dangerous to to go take free candy from a stranger in a van, right? What they don't discern, they don't see the difference between what is truth and error. What is, or what Spurgeon said is truth and almost truth. They don't have the ability to see the difference. So what is the result of this discipleship? If we understand the work of the ministry and we're at a church that is full of disciples who make disciples, then what is one of the fruits? What is one of the purposes? That we have discernment. We're able to see the difference between truth and almost truth. And you know that process when somebody new comes to church and they say a lot of things that are uh, wrong or half-truths and you try and take them to the side and help them to understand. You see how that's an almost truth? That's not a truth truth. That's a almost truth. And you try and help them to see the difference. That's one of the purposes of the ministry. That's one of the purposes of the ministry. Okay, so then we have another purpose where in verse 15, we're speaking the truth in love. We're speaking the truth in love. That we, uh, one of the results, one of the purposes behind the ministry is that we end up, yes, speaking the truth. Yes, helping people discern, but look at the way we're doing it. it the maturity, the fruit, the result of a, of a godly biblical ministry is that we end up speaking the truth in love. Again, for the purpose, all, again, Christ-centered. You see in verse 15? That we may grow up to all things unto him who is the head. Christ. 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 And then in verse 16, from whom the whole, um, again, Christ. From when it says from whom, referring back to Christ. The whole body joined and knit together by every joint supplies. Again, describing the, the imagery of a body and the unity. For the effective working of every part does it share. Again, back to everybody doing the work of the ministry. That this, we're a church of disciples who makes disciples and causes growth for the body of the edifying of itself in love. So we, we briefly look over this complicated sentence in, in verses 11 to 16. And we saw these two parts. Christ, the king of spiritual gifts. Christ in the gospel who wins Victory, booty, treasures, spoils. And who are, what's part of those, the, that, what he's won in the victory? People. People that he gives back to his church as gifts so that they would serve, so that churches would be groups of disciples who make more disciples. And we see all the good fruits and results of that. If we're, we're doing the, the ministry the way God wants, look at all the good things it produces. Unity, maturity, discernment, speaking the truth in love, the, the whole, everyone doing the work of the ministry. And so that, what's the purpose? Christ is glorified. Christ is glorified. Christ is glorified. So that we would know Christ. We'd be like Him and speak about Him. And so we have this, 
explanation of what it means to be a biblical church. What it means, what, uh, and we, what's the purpose and the main, the bottom line? I want you to see Christ, how it's Christ-centered and how everything is directed towards him. How everything is directed towards him for a good purpose. So in remembering this uh, explanation of the ministry, this is what we would want to do in Guatemala. Being a missionary is not really much different than, I think being, being a biblical missionary is not much different than serving here in the local church. So being faithful here is the same thing we would want to do in Guatemala. It's not like it's, there's some um, another level of Christianity to be a missionary, or it's, you're, we're just doing the same things that we do here. We try and make disciples who make disciples. We go, we preach the word. We go and disciple, teach in conversations, in classes, in various ways. We go and evangelize. And the same things the Lord uses here, the same things he uses there. It's just in a different language, a little different culture, different setting. Maybe a little cooler, maybe a little warmer. But basically, we're, it's the same thing. It's not superstar Christianity. It's just Christianity. Pastors aren't on another level. They're just regular uh, people, regular another gift that Christ has won, has saved, and allowed them to be examples, to another disciple who makes disciples. And so that's what we uh, want to do in Guatemala. And so now we're going to transition from this brief summary of Ephesians 4, and now we want to talk about some of the practicality of a report about how that has worked itself out in Guatemala in the past year. I think it's been a year since I've been here last, or a little, or about 13 months. And so let's go turn to Acts, Acts 14. I think every year I read this verse. Maybe next year you guys will be able to quote it to me. In Acts 14, we, we're going to read verses 25 to 27. We remember, we, we remember the setting is that Paul and Barnabas were sent out from the church of Antioch, and here they've come back to Antioch, the church that sent them, for the purpose, and we'll see the, some of this purpose here, and we read verses 25 to 27. Now when they had preached the word at Perga, they went down to Attilia. From there they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work which they had completed, now, when they had come and gathered the church together, they reported all that God had done to, with them, and then he opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. So they stayed there a long time with the disciples. So we're trying to apply verse 27 here in this Sunday school. We're trying to gather the church together, and we're trying to give a report of what God has done. And so that how he's opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. I like how God centered this text is. That when, we, when Paul talked about the ministry, he talked about how it's something that God had done and that how it's something that how he opened the door, how he saves souls, how he does his work. And so uh, let's do the, the same now. Let's do the same now. So I'll try and work through some of the calendar uh, or work through as a timeline some of the things that have happened in Guatemala to give a report to you all. We want to thank you for your prayers. We hear your prayers on Sunday nights on the live stream or at different times during the week, during uh, different ways that they, we, we're thankful for the internet ministry. We try and get ready on Sunday mornings and, and watch you guys. And when you guys greet one another at the beginning of the service, uh, we always look to see if we, who's there and watch from Guatemala through that camera over there. So we're always very excited to see new people or to see old people, either one. <laughs> and so let me get back to the report. So we're, we're in the report here. Um, last year, we were here in February. So we ended up as a church finishing the exposition of the Gospel of Mark. Last time we were here, we were, fin we were finishing up the book of Mark, and we began the book of Ephesians. And so we were preaching through the book of Ephesians verse by verse in the church. 
At that time, last year, we were going through the book of Redemption, Accomplished and Applied, which is a very encouraging small book about the work of the Christ and the atonement. And it gives a good explanation to the, the people in the church about the extent of the atonement, the, uh, what Christ has accomplished in the atonement, to give them a good understanding of the gospel. Last March, we were continuing through in what would be a, like a midweek service in the, in the book of Proverbs. We're going through the book of Proverbs verse by verse. We were, in, we were in chapter 19 back then. And last March, a cornerstone team of Edgar, Mitchell, Ryan, Esther, Troy, Joby came. We were able to have the blessing of going open air preaching, had numerous gospel opportunities and funerals there, be able to preach the gospel. Funerals there are different as soon as somebody passes away in Guatemala, because they don't, I think because they don't have refrigeration then they, as soon as someone passes away, they begin a, that night will be an all-night uh, vigil. And so the t- family will typically stay up all night. And that's a, a great opportunity to preach the gospel in conversations, or sometimes there's opportunities to preach to everybody there. And then the next morning, they bury the person. So it happens very fast, within 24 hours. And so there's usually two gospel opportunities, one at the vigil and then one at the, at the burial. And so um, we were able to join in, the team was able to join in in those different uh, gospel opportunities. Last April, our daughter was born, Cassandra, and she's in the back. She's 11 months now and growing fast. Uh, Gracias a Dios, uh, empecé a predicar en español el último abril. Thanks to God, I began to preach in Spanish in the, old, the last April. And that was a big answer to prayer for me, because it was some years in the making that I would be able to have the ability to preach in Spanish. So that's still growing, still coming along, still quite a work to be done. And I still take weekly classes from one of the brothers, a Colombian brother who's uh, new in the faith, has a few years in the faith, named Ugo, and he's been a great help to me to be able to explain the grammar repeatedly and repeatedly and repeatedly to me. And pronunciation, that's another thing. You, you guys can, those who are native Spanish speakers will hear when you talk with Benjamin, you can hear his pronunciation is a lot better than mine. And the Guatemalans note it too. <laughs> so he's, uh, I know in the future he's going to be help me. <laughs> So last May, we were able to begin to go through evangelism study. So it's Tell the Truth by Will Metzger. And uh, we were also able to have gospel opportunities at more funerals. Sadly, we've had a lot more funerals than than weddings. We have yet to have a wedding in uh, in Guatemala. So we're we're praying for it to balance out, but there's been a lot of of, uh, funerals. But... You know how Ecclesiastes says it's better to go to the house of mourning than to, to go to a, a party or a festival or a house of rejoicing. So it's better preaching the gospel at those times. And so, but there's also been other gospel opportunities. I'm just mentioning ones that are outside of the norm, outside of the regular preaching during the week. Is our church typically will, or will, will try and have fellowships, church-wide fellowships every other Sunday, and then we'll go evangelizing on those Sundays. Because Sunday, a lot of the more people in our church work six days a week. And uh, so Sunday is the day to be able to basically try and pack in small group, church, and evangelism. <laughs> so if you guys think Cornerstone Sundays are packed, you should come visit us. <laughs> but the, so we were able to have uh, last May... We were able to have some new members join our small church. And, and then June, we were able to have some baptism services. So an aunt of ours, Cecia, was able to become a member and be baptized. And some brothers from, uh, that, that travel two hours um, every Sunday to come to church uh, on the bus with their families. And they got young babies, um, some, one baby less than a year old. And so they, they pack up their family um, regularly around um, 6 o'clock in the morning to try and get on the bus to get there, and church starts at 9.30. So that's just a regular routine. 
So West Siders, you guys don't have anything to complain about? <laughs> a wise man once said, the road to a good church is not long. One of your pastors. <laughs> And so those brothers are very are good encouragement, but they also ask for prayer, that they would be faithful to be able to continue to regularly attend. And, and uh, it's not easy. It's not difficult. They're not super Christians. They're just regular people. So they need the, the prayer that they would be faithful in order to attend. And also they have uh, family members that maybe not, are not um, as excited to be able to come to church. And so those men need help to be able to lead their families with wisdom and, and grace. So then last, we're working through the months, February, March, April, May of 2019. So we talked about how in June of last year, it was a blessing to have new members. And then in July, uh, we were able to meet another church that had recently adopted, or be, meet another pastor of another church in the city who had recently adopted the 1689 confession, which is very encouraging because we, as far as we know, we are the first church in Guatemala that would be Reformed Baptist. So then to hear of another church on the other side of town that uh, apart from us had recognized that the 1689 Confession was very encouraging. It was very encouraging. So we were able to meet with that pastor and hopefully we'll be able to continue to cultivate a friendship. Uh, it's a church called Grace Over Grace or, um, in the pastor's Manuel Valle. So he was able to come to a conference and hopefully we'll be able to continue that friendship and then last year, September, uh, we were able to have a conference, which was a great blessing. Pastor Michael came, preached the gospel to us, and Joby, Joby is our, uh, the faithful missionary who continually comes back to see us and serve us. Edgar, Joby, Ryan have come multiple times. They're like a family coming back and again and again and again. And we were happy with them coming back. So it's a, a great encouragement to have them come. And we had a conference on the doctrines of grace. We had a pastor from Costa Rica that, that came in as well. It was a, a great encouragement to his, his see the pastors be able to fellowship one, with one another and then speak to the people who are attending to the conference. Uh, last October, I was able to visit the States for my cousin's, a cousin's wedding cousin's wedding in New York, and then we, there's a, a church in New York that's praying for the, the church plant in Guatemala uh, in Poland Baptist Church in New York. So now they're, they're praying and supporting us, which is a great encouragement. So whenever I try and go back and visit my grandparents up there in upstate New York, it's, it's far away from Christ the King, four hours or so from Christ the King. So or three hours, something like that. It's like from here to Jacksonville. So it's not that close, but... Uh, so in last November, we were able to preach the gospel in a time of having a Thanksgiving dinner. So in Guatemala, they don't have Thanksgiving. It's a very American holiday. And so we were, but we're still able to have pumpkin pie and turkey and do all that kind of American stuff and then invite all the, the Guatemalans, and they invited other family members, and it ends up becoming a big dinner that we, uh, we have a carport there, essentially in Guatemala in our place, and we turn it into an evangelistic service. Maybe about 40 people come, and then I, I know another missionary in Italy who also turned Thanksgiving into a, an evangelistic opportunity. So it was a good idea, and the Lord blessed it to be able to, to preach the gospel to other family members and other people that were not normally part of the church. Also, we were able in last November to, to have another couple join, J uh, Jair and Anya, and they were, they were a great blessing and encouragement. They're from Honduras, a country next nearby, Guatemala. And so what's particularly encouraging about them is their, their zeal and joy to be able to serve the Lord. So it's not a burden for them to reach out, take the initiative, serve, and in many different ways, many different ways, or, evan or evangelize. So last December, uh, we were blessed to be able to have a brother from a church in Miami. If you guys know, remember Victor Garcia, was a pastor in Miami who preached here at a 
marriage conference a few years back. They're, they have, he has a deacon there named Rogelio, and they're planning to move to Guatemala. And it's a great blessing to be able to do, have an open-air tr- preaching event for the church. And so the entire church will go out to the downtown area during the daytime and, dur- and during the daytime at Christmas there. It's packed full of people. And we're able to have a church-wide evangelistic event in the downtown area. And so in December, uh, we were also, in January, we were able to begin a study on contentment. Contentment by a book by Jeremiah Burroughs, The Rare Jewel of Christian Contentment. Those of you who have read that and been blessed by that, it's a very... uh, encouraging, convicting, helpful way to think through how, do, how we complain in our hearts, how we don't think about all the blessings in the gospel, and how encouraging it is to reorient our lives around, to be around, centered around God and not around ourselves. So it was a very sanctifying, helpful study to help us battle with sin, help us uh, grow in understanding of accountability, zeal, consistency. So when we look back at this that year in 2019, what's very been very encouraging is to see the the growth in particular members of the church. And we try and um, my wife is better at this than me doing all these these uh, details. We try and give these these uh, pictures of the church so you would be able to put it on your fridge or put it somewhere in your office or somewhere so you would remember to pray for our church. And so as I look at it, this picture, uh, it's, I know it's a lot, for a, a number of you, there are a number of faces that you don't know. But, it's, but for me, this is like looking at a family picture, right? And so I pray for these people weekly. I um, speak with them. I love them. They're my family. So I, I want you to continue to pray for them and to continue to labor in that way for their uh, growth in the faith they have struggles. They want, um, I would want them to grow in love. I would want them to have consistency and, and apply the word in their home life and, and on the, in their work life. I'm thankful about to see how they've grown, the believers here, how they've grown in zeal and consistency or maturity. I would want to take this time to, to thank the Lord for the Rusis again. They came and visited you recently. And they are continuing to be a great blessing to us. Lee's preaching this morning in Colossians 1, verses 15 to 17, about Christ and his glory and his person and his work. And so Alex, who many of you know, who, he loves to visit America. He loves America. He wants to come move here eventually. His English is pretty good. He'll, he'll be back here to visit you guys again soon, I'm sure. And so he's, uh, he's going to be teaching a lesson on hermeneutics this morning at Sunday school. It's the first time of him teaching a class, so he's a bit nervous. We talked last night, so I'll, I've been praying for him. That, that's one of the encouraging stories to, to think about and to pray about for them. So in this past uh, January and February, um, Lee's dad passed away. And he uh, came here for the funeral because his dad lived here in Orlando. And I'm thankful for, for your, the love of you all to support them, to care for them when they were here, and a number of you to, to attend a funeral, too. I'm, and I'm thankful for how the Lord opened the door for the gospel there. This year, we've begun in February and January, we've begun to study on the hermeneutics, some basic of hermeneutics, using and grasping God's word. I'm thankful that some of these resources in Spanish and how we're uh, also begun to study on the regulative principle of worship. And in other words, how do we think about how the Bible teaches us how to worship God in song? And so that's been a helpful study, and we're going to continue to work on, through that on the midweek service. Recently, a pastor from El Salvador has reached out to us and he is seeking fellowship. They've recently become a Reformed church. And so he's, been, he's actually Cuban. They're actually a Cuban family who lived in Canada. And then 
Canadian church sent them as missionaries to El Salvador. So it's kind of mixed up, but it works out. It works out. So the church that sent them from Canada, sadly, is they don't have good fellowship with that church because they, uh, this particular pastor has grown on his own from reading the Bible and reading resources. So there, it, it's, um, I can't remember the denomination that sent him from Canada. But he doesn't have good encouragement from them. He's not on the same page as them theologically. They don't want him to be reformed. They don't want him to, so they opposed him putting reformed in the name of the church. And so he's, when he, we met for coffee and he, when he, was, he came by on vacation, went out of the way in order to come and visit us. And when I explained the, the prayer and like-mindedness that you all have and the communication that I have with the pastors on a weekly basis and the, the, the Rusis that were sent with us and the help that we have from having a Barnabas to be able to be with us or sent out two by two or Silas, then he was, had tears in his eyes listening to all of these things. And so he's trying to work towards a more biblical church and a more biblical ministry. And so he invited us to go and preach the gospel at his church in, uh, and to speak about church ministry in a conference in October. And this so was a neighboring country. About four, it was about four hours away, four or five hours away drive. So that's an encouraging thing that's come up recently, a few weeks ago. And he's been texting me while we were on the trip about... Um, how do you think through who becomes a member? How do they become a member? Church government. And so he's trying to grow with these things because he doesn't have a good background. Uh, that. So in things that, things that are coming up, um, we have a missionary trip, the first missionary trip for Antorcha. Uh, the, a church in Honduras, another country right nearby, it's about an eight-hour drive, has asked us to come over and disciple their church and open-air preaching. So we're going to try and get a group of maybe eight people from the church in Antorcha to be able to go over there. And it's a pastor that Pastor Dale actually got us connected with from on, online. And so some of you know um, uh, the pastor there in um, Iglesia Bautista Renacer. And so they're reforming their church. They recently got out of the uh, Southern Baptist Convention and have adopted the 1689 as well. So it's been difficult for them, and learning is also a changing worship. Worship in music, that, that can be a very difficult thing for um, Latinos, really, to, uh, to think through how you apply sola scriptura to the music as opposed to just what is, um, what is cultural or what is uh, what you would like, what you grew up with, as opposed to now begin to think, what is, how do we apply, is the Bible sufficient to teach us what we should do in corporate worship and how we can be more God-centered in that? So that church is, is wrestling through those things and thinking through those things. And also the, the pastor wants them to grow in open-air preaching. Coming up um, in May... We're praying and looking forward to some of you coming. We had to change the, the, the date of the trip because of our busyness in March to come and visit you guys and the, 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 the missionary trip that we have in March to Honduras. In June 4th to the 6th, I would like to invite some of you all to go to the Bahamas if you're able to. I'm going to go preach at a conference in the Bahamas. And if any of you have extra money to come... <laughs> Because this, there's a ref, the Reformed, Reformed Believers Conference that uh, Sean has preached at before. And so we have an invitation to go preach. And then I'm inviting you all because it's in English, the conference. And so not too many people from Antorcha could, could have the funds to go or be not, not too many understand English too. So. so I would love it if any of you were able to come. Then it's June 4th to the 6th. And who, who doesn't like to go visit the Bahamas? <laughs> in July, upcoming, the, there's a group of ladies from Antorcha that are looking forward and wanting to come here to the ladies' conference. 
You know, the most well-known thing about Cornerstone is the lady con- ladies' conferences that you all put on. We're known around the Reformed community for ladies' conferences. <laughs> and so we have a group of maybe five ladies that are excited and, and planning to come here. Some are working on visas, and so there's paperwork and, and more things to be done in order to visit. It is, it is a pretty short plane ride um, now that we have direct flights. So you can be, be from Guatemala City, and within four hours, five hours, you can, you can be in Orlando on the ground in immigration. <laughs> so we're, going, we're also planning in the next few months to go over the doctrine of repentance with the church and church history. And, uh, um, and also, like I mentioned, well, God willing, we'll... we'll be able to visit a, that church in El Salvador. So I didn't leave too much time, but uh, let me summarize so far, and then we'll open it up for a few questions. The, we looked at a, a brief introduction or in, uh, explanation of Ephesians 4, and what is a God-centered ministry? Churches that are full of disciples who make disciples, that's centered on Christ. For his glory, do, do we grow in his likeness? Then he's the king of spiritual gifts. He's the one who's orchestrated this ministry. And then we, we, I gave a brief report of some of the highlights. How do you summarize a year in 20 minutes, right? I, well, I tried. <laughs> so it's been, it's been a good year. It's been a difficult year. But uh, the honeymoon is over in Iglesia Antorcha, and now it's more into regular life. It's in the regular life, and so uh, we're back in, we're into regular struggles of the Christian life, that then into regular church life that you guys are in, too. So please continue to pray for us, and we're excited about those things that are coming up in this year. So I just mentioned some of those big things, highlights, conferences, so that you all can know and maybe even participate in in the future. So we have about... Eight minutes. Eight minutes for questions. If anyone has any questions um, about Iglesia Antorcha, Iglesia Bautista Reformada Antorcha um, in Guatemala, questions about ministry, you can raise your hand. I listen to Sunday school, so I know who the ones who typically like to talk. <laughs> And so all others of you are more quiet. <laughs> Brother? On Sundays, um, how many people, um, you know, members and non-members, what, what's your, uh, uh, like, head count? Like? Yeah. That's a good question. Thank you. Um, basically, like the picture. Basically, like the picture is about a typical Sunday for us. It can be a bit less and a little bit, little bit more. Um, yeah, it's growing slowly by the, by the grace of God. And um, so we've also had some new contacts from visitors. It's a very encouraging that the work that the Lord is doing from the Internet, that a lot of people from different towns or different places hear about the gospel from Reformed Ministries in Spanish on the Internet. And so we have some, also some new contacts, new visitors one particular lady we met in evangelism that we would like her to be able to come. She's attending a Pentecostal church. Her name is Wendy. And so she listened to open-air uh, open sermoncito, we say, like a little sermon that we preach in open air. And then um, there in the, in the culture, it's different. When you, afterwards, when you talk to people on the street in evangelism, like in a park, more people will come and listen to the conversation and so you can just have to begin a conversation with an individual. And they see you have a Bible, people walking by. And so they, don't, it, they feel comfortable to just butt in the conversation and listen. <laughs> and so one of those ladies was Wendy. And so Jair, the, the new member that, from Honduras, he was preaching the gospel to somebody. And he noticed she was listening. So he, after he preached the gospel to somebody, he turned to her and said, oh, I noticed you were listening to everything. And so he began to talk to her. And she said, yeah, I'm listening to Suhel Michelin, Miguel Nunez, um, Paul, Pablo Washer, like all the, Paul Washer. So they, um, these are reform, the Reformed um, people. 
So if somebody mentions those names, it's like saying, oh, I'm listening to John MacArthur, I'm listening to Paul Washer, in English, Paul Washer, or Albert Martin, these kind of uh, names that people listen to. So, and we hand her a track from Chapel Library, and she's like, oh, I read material from Chapel Library. So you, it's as rare there to meet somebody, you can imagine somebody from evangelism, you knock on somebody's door, or you meet somebody at Park who says all those things, you're like, wow, that's unusual. <laughs> that doesn't happen uh, very much. So give me your phone number. <laughs> you're going to Pentecostal church, you need to get out of that church, and <laughs> you need a sound church. It was like that. So there's context like that. We're trying to continue to talk to them, call them, encourage them. There's a few contacts like that. So that was a long answer to a short question. Sorry. Rebecca? I was wondering um, if the church corporately has experienced, like, trials or persecution. Like, have mm -hmm. you, like, started to be, like, known for, you know, oh, this church is blank or mm -hmm. too hard or, you know, um, too judgmental mm -hmm. as a church corporately? So that's a good question. Uh, that typically comes with more time. Because we're such a small church, not too many people know we exist. And so the persecution on that level usually comes after more time. So yes, there's, it comes in small ways, um, in conversations with people or family members that aren't as excited about um, the real gospel or things we've said. But... Um, uh, Thank God uh, we haven't experienced that on a, on a more, uh, on a wider level. But those things come in time. Those things come in time. There's different dynamics when you have a real small church to having a church, a medium-sized church like we have here, to a big, having a bigger church. Like churches that have more influence, uh, like the church that puts on G3 or Grace Community or bigger churches, they have uh, more difficult trials than smaller churches. So we're a real small church. So we don't have the influence that you guys have. So um, there's just a, it's just a different um, aspects to being a smaller church or bigger church. So those things come in a small ways for us now. But if um, we would want the gospel to grow, we want to be able to reach more people. And when we reach more people, we know that also more persecution comes from different areas. We don't want it, but that's... Um, but it's normal. It's normal. So, but thanks. That's a that's a good question. So it's like it's like one of those um, things that uh, will come in time. We're not we're not uh, um, we know it'll come in time. Troy, he knew I was going to ask a question. <laughs> I knew you were one of the talkers. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> lot to say. <clears throat> um, have you tried or can you use anything like um, media outlets mm -hmm. to um, maybe have a radio broadcast or something like that that you can do down there to reach people? I know radio is pretty big there compared to here because of the, you know, that country. Like it was here, radio was huge here one time. So mm -hmm. I don't know if you're doing anything like that. So currently, no. I think um, my Spanish needs to grow. And like... Um, Right now, I'd prefer to put other people, like uh, uh, other preachers forward, like, you know, uh, Suhel Michelin or other Reformed preachers, and, and in time, my Spanish will have to grow to the point where, because um, my, my Spanish is, is simple. Simple, and the people understand, and the people are gracious and patient with me, uh, but I think that for now, that... I, I need to grow as a preacher before doing some of those things. So we, we're, we would need to work on maybe more conversations or short videos. And so Alex has done some of those things for, uh, on a YouTube channel. And so we could do more of that, putting out like eight-minute material, the gospel, or things like that. So Facebook is the big thing in, in Guatemala or in Latin America because websites take money um, but, and, and take more money than then a lot of businesses are, are prepared or churches are prepared to, to be able to pay. And so Facebook is free. You can have a Facebook for free, page for free. And so churches typically don't use websites. They use Facebook page there. So we do use Facebook and we do put all, we put all the services, all the calls to worship in Facebook. And so those things are what we typically send out to people in the way that we would use online for now. So all the calls to, um, if somebody understands Spanish, 
you, you all can listen to the calls to the repentance, call to worship, the sermons. Everything's there on the Facebook page. So we're trying, we need to grow in YouTube and other, other areas. But thank you, that's a good question. One more question? Hermano? I was going to ask you, uh, what's one way that you've seen the church grow? Uh, one way we've seen the church grow? Um, like my, mo- my wife mentioned uh, to me, I asked her that. Uh, what was something that you would want us to say to the church cornerstone? And she mentioned about um, thankfulness, about how the church is growing in contentment, the church is growing with a battle with sin, um, wanting to be held accountable. And one example she mentioned is there's a uh, single mother named Astrid. She would, my wife gave me this to you so that it would help reference, because I say names and then you don't know, don't know who I'm talking about. So she would be uh, in the f- lower right-hand corner. She's a single mother with her son, Anthony. He's wearing red. And so uh, she gets to work on a moto or like a little motorbike. And so her um, moto bro- broke down on the way to church. Something ran- wrong with the carburetor. So um, she walked to church, had been walking to church now, and recently. And so she was walking to church after her um, moto broke down, her motorcycle or her um, moped, I think is the, it's not really a motorcycle, I think moped, right? It's the right term. So she came, um, had the, in her heart the tendency to complain, oh, I have to walk to church, and it's little ways, and so... She was applying what we were learning in the contentment study by Jeremiah Burroughs and being thankful for having a church, thankful that she's a Christian. And it was very encouraging to hear someone talk about how they're applying the the Word of God to their own lives. So that's an example of um, Christian growth that's very encouraging to us to be able to hear those things from the people and others with it, wanting to see their own sin, wanting to grow, wanting to identify um, how they can apply the Word of God. Um, the zeal of others in the church, like the brother I mentioned with um, Jair, that uh, he would be in the top picture, in the middle, at the back row, one of the tallest guys if you look there, and he's wearing a sweater right next to his wife who's got kind of a yellow shirt. Yellowish. I'm sorry, I'm colorblind. So I'm, I'm not sure if it's, I think it's yellow. Yeah. So his zeal in, in for the evangelism, for serving the church, to being ready to sacrifice and say, oh, I'll drop off these brothers who don't have a car. And he has a car. to say, oh, yeah, I'll drive the hour and an hour and a half back. And after he's been um, working hard all week and he owns his own business, to be able to take the initiative to do those kinds of things is really encouraging, really encouraging. So some of the Christian growth, Christian growth has been one of the encouraging uh, areas of, of growth. Well, let's go ahead and uh, begin to close. Thank you again for your support, for your prayers, for, uh, I can't tell you the, the, the impact of your prayers that have um, that's one of the things you'll, you'll only be able to see, will only be able to see well from heaven, I think, to see the, but I'm, I am very sure of many of the things of grace in, that God has done graciously in our church are connected or, or result of the prayers of you all. The more that you are in prayer and the more you're involved in the, that way that you are in supporting the, the church plant, the more joy you have in hearing about those things and it makes your, it reorients your life off of yourself and towards the glory of God in a very joyful way. And so I hope that this, this mission update has been encouragement for you so that you would be more zealous, that you would be more involved in prayer, that you would be thinking about God's glory and His work in the ministry and less self-focused and less... Uh, more content in his, him being glorified. Let's go ahead and pray. Thank you, Lord, for the things you've done in 2019 uh, and the beginning of this year. We want to thank you for the work you've done here in that time. Thank you for helping us to grow here, the church here to grow. 
in many ways. Thank you for the new faces I see. Thank you for your gracious uh, work in the gospel, saving sinners. Thank you for doing work in Guatemala. Thank you for the brothers there. And we pray this morning that uh, you would help them to be able to worship you, spirit and truth. We pray that they would forget about themselves. They would not be self-focused and selfish, but they would be focused on you and your glory and how to help others be disciples who make disciples. We pray for Lee as he preaches or prepares to preach your word now at this very moment, that you would glorify your son through Colossians 1, verses 15 to 17. We pray that you, you be glorified in the church there through the hermeneutics class, that you would help them to learn how to make observations and sound interpretations so that you, your voice would be heard through the means of your word. We pray that you would help them to have discernment and maturity and speak the truth in love. Thank you, Lord, for this time to be able to speak about what things you've done. We recognize that everything good has come as a result of you. And we recognize our need for grace here in Orlando and in Guatemala, a grace to be in order to persevere and continue in the faith. So please help us by your spirit to walk in the spirit and not by our own strength. So we pray, please be glorified and honored in the worship service today. Amen.